All right, I think we're ready to get going here. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's having a good week. Um, not too crazy with midterm uh, exams yet, but I think they're probably going to come. Um, I guess some classes, like a lot of mine, have multiple exams throughout the semester, so that's probably already done anyway. Um, thank you for everybody who has their camera on. Who doesn't have them on, please turn them on. Um, however, if you do have your camera on and I can only see the ceiling, then it's not really that helpful because I can't, right? The idea of having the camera on means I can see your face, which means I can get some level of information of what you are thinking about. And I can't necessarily get that information off of the ceiling. Um, all right, with that, I think I will get going. Um, oh, before we get going, I hope you all saw that I returned the uh, the proposals yesterday, I think. Um, and so I think it'll be good because I, for some groups uh, or for, for uh, multiple groups, there was kind of a little bit of an issue about um, defining the problem a little too narrowly or already focusing on an exact solution. Um, so I would like to basically meet with each of you guys. Um, and so uh, with each of the groups. So I have a fair amount of time tomorrow. So if you guys can get together the group, figure out a good time for, for us to meet either tomorrow, which is Friday or beginning of next week. Um, I'd like to sit down, it doesn't have to be long, maybe 15 minutes or so. Just uh, give me some options and I'll, I'll tell you uh, when to meet just to make sure that before you start working on the on the annotated bibliography that you're you're going in the right direction. Are there any questions about that? No, okay, good. Well, if, if there are, we can do those in, in the small session. So again, please reach out to me and schedule an appointment, one per group. All right, All right so let's get started. Today we're going to talk about materials. Seems to me that materials, when it comes to uh, bio-inspired design, is kind of the first thing that people think of, just because we have so many materials that are, in one way or another, um, inspired by by biology or that are just biological uh, to start out with. Um, so let's get going there. Um, so of course, materials are all around us, right? We're everything around us is made out of something. By, by definition, right? It could be, it doesn't matter if it's the interior of a car or an entire city or hospital room or a dorm room. And I have to say this dorm room is uh, is spacious and well-lighted compared to what my kids have uh, lived in or are living in at the moment. They tend to be a lot more cramped and uh, pretty sure that that window is, is a lot smaller in my son's room. But nonetheless, right, you can see this is even like a small place like like a university dorm room is is filled with all kinds of different materials, right? There's some kind of wood, there's some kind of a rug on the floor, um, made out of some fabric, there's some tile probably made out of PVC, there's a computer with all its components, right? There's the with the the blades, the the shades here made out of probably out of metal, and there's glass, there's the fabric on the bed, so tons of it, right? And, same thing if you think about the hospital bed or, or, or any of these, right? And so we've become very good at creating all these different uh, materials. So of course, nature has created all kinds of exciting materials as well, right? So you have um, just a couple of things here, right? You have materials that are very uh, hydrophobic, right? For basically the water just rolls off of, right? That's kind of the, the eyes of this, this bug here. You have the very tough skin of an alligator, but that's still, that's very tough skin, but it's still very flexible, can move around. You have the slime that a a, a, um, a snail discretes as it moves along, right, to move easier. You have these polyps that are more or less transparent, right, so very interesting. You have uh, this cormoran, I guess, or pelican or something that has 
you can see the fish that's flying in it, but and so on, right? You have all these very interesting materials. I think some of you already talked about uh, elephant skin in your in your proposals, uh, and of course we've talked at length at uh, at the silk from a spider already, right? So there's all these different materials that nature uh, can can create as well, a whole variety. And of course, we just want to think about what material is, right? Of course, in the very basic sense, it's all atoms, or if you want to go lower down, quarks and whatever. Um, but these atoms group together to be molecules. And then of course, those molecules group together to produce the materials that, that we're used to, right? Stuff that we can touch. We can't see or touch atoms or molecules. Or of course, we can touch them because we can touch materials, but we can't perceive them separately, right? So, but once they get to bigger groups of molecules, that's stuff that we can actually interact with on a daily basis. And that's kind of what we think about when we think about materials. Now, we need materials for all kinds of different things, right? We can, the way that we decide on what it is that we're going to use, right, is, of course, has to be available, right? We don't want to build something out of, only out of gold and platinum or something, right? Because it's going to be too expensive. There's not enough around. Um, it needs to be manufacturable and constructible, right? So it has to be something that I can shape and form, those kind of things. There's probably some level of properties that are very important for me, right? It could be something like how well does it uh, transmit electricity or heat or, or those kind of things, how shatterproof is it, all those kind of things we can think about. And if you take... Um, if you're in industrial engineering, right, then you'll take material sciences, and that's going to go into a whole lot more detail about all these types of materials. Um, and then there's like, you know, how well can I can I service uh, the things that I have? Very importantly, how does something fail? Right, we always have to when we design something, we have to live with the fact that it, it may fail, and, and how how does that failure happen? It's very important, right? So that's one big difference between uh, steel and, and concrete um, is that concrete fails um, slowly, or they both fail slowly, but concrete shows that it's about to fail while steel tends not to, right? So if you have a concrete beam that's overweight and starting to crack, it's gonna start sagging and sagging and sagging, maybe not for a very long time, but enough time to get people out of a building, for instance, or out from under a bridge. Whereas steel often fails very quickly, right? By the time it gets to its failure stress, it's there and it's gone. Um, then of course, other things that are important are more and more important are sustainability. And of course, cost has always been a big, big question about what uh, what are we gonna use? Um, and of course, not everything is, is good for everything that we wanna build. So here's three different um, things that are, that we have around us, right? Cars, cell phones, and, and fridges. And we can see that, you know, for instance, here, this, this car, right, is more than half of it is, is steel. If you add in the other major metal components like iron and aluminum, right, then we have like about three quarters of this car are, are just basically iron and, and aluminum, right? So it's very, very uh, steel, very, very uh, driven by those types of materials, whereas your cell phone is 40% plastic, right? So there's not as much, much metal in a cell phone because of course it doesn't have to be as strong, right? Like car needs to be strong because if I smashed into something, I want the other thing to break and, and not me. Uh, refrigerators, again, very much relied on steel, but also quite a bit of plastic, right? So again, depending on what we want from an object, we will design it with that, uh, we will choose the materials based on that. And of course, because we're talking about bio-inspiration, right, at some point or another, we'll have to talk about sustainabilities. And so if we want to stay, think about the sustainability of material systems, then um, the usual thing that we already talked about kind of applies, right? So we want to minimize the non-renewable uh, resources, right, that is on the one side for energy, but also just minerals, right? I mean, the more the more, like, okay, with steel, it doesn't really matter because there's, like, you know, our, our, our planet is to a very large extent iron, so like, well, I'm not gonna run out of steel all that quickly, um, but there are other elements that we're having more difficulty with, right? Especially what we call, very aptly call rare earth uh, metals, right? Those are, are, are and elements, those are, are not that many of. Um, as we're producing our materials, we want to conserve renewable resources as well, right? So if you think about um, using wood, we won't, don't want to overuse wood, right? Um, and that has happened in the past. That was a major concern for, for the English 
um, when they were building their empire and built all these ships, they basically cut out, cut down all the trees in England to create uh, to create ships, and there actually was a was a, a lack of, of of wood for quite a while um, there for that reason. Um, we want to minimize waste, just like with everything else, right? So we want to create. Uh, we're going to use materials that we can recycle, right? So that's one thing for that already says that you know maybe steel and aluminum are are good things to use in our product because we know we can recycle them. Same similar with glass. Um, a lot of the plastics we cannot recycle, so those would not be things that we probably want to use as much. We want to make sure that whenever we're creating these materials, we're not try uh, creating any. Uh, toxic emissions uh, as we're creating them, and of course, as we're using them the same way. And then we want to minimize the carbon emissions. And all those kind of things we want to think about when we're creating something, right? And so I think this is this is where this all falls back on us as engineers. We want to make sure that um, as we're working on these kind of things, that we choose materials that fit to these categories, right? There might be I might be designing something and I have a choice between two different materials. Well, maybe this one material is a little more expensive and maybe not quite as strong. So maybe I'll have to make it a little bit bigger, but the material that I can now use is very recyclable, for instance, right? So those were really things where we want to uh, take those into account. Now, at the moment, we're not all that big on renewable materials when we do, uh, when we produce things, right? You can see that was over 80% of everything that we produce um, is non-renewable non materials. And why, why do you think that there's so much non-renewable um, like, you know, in, in, in the stuff that we produce? Is it because it's cheaper? Well, I was kind of thinking about what are the things that we're producing that are, that are non-renewable when we think about Oh, um, it's all it's all whatever is cheaper is what we choose. So that's also hitting. <laughs> what is one of the things that almost everything is made of that is definitely not not a renewable material? Oh well, we have plastic. Plastic, plastic of course, right? Because plastic is made out of oil in in the end, right? Or or natural gas, some hydrocarbon. And so every time we use plastic, unless it's unless it's recycled. Right, would be a non-renewable resource, and of course, this is not this is not something I want to we want that we want to keep going with. Now, if we look at the types of material that we use, then we can quickly see that um, we're dominated by construction materials. Right, so most of the materials, if you just think about the overall mass of stuff that we that we use, then we use most of it for construction. Right, that's this this gray shaded area. I think it's always interesting to see that you can kind of see major world events in how we use our materials, right? So you have the Great Depression. Of course, we stopped building stuff during the Great Depression. We have the Second World War. Well, during the war, not all that much, you know, civil construction was going on. But then right afterward, it booms because, of course, all of Europe was in ruins and had to be rebuilt, right? So there's a lot of it's a very strong boom that, that lasts for more than a decade. And then we have other kind of shocks to the economy, oil crisis, recessions, the big global financial crisis. I think you're probably too young to kind of have that in, in you. Like, you know, you had, didn't really experience that um, firsthand that much. But it was it was very, uh, you know, because like nobody was building houses, like no companies were building new office buildings. All those kind of things completely fell apart. So that's why we have this big, big drop in construction material. Now, what is the number one construction material that we use, do you think? Is it concrete? Of course, right? Just look at a beautiful view like this, right? I have no idea what city this is, but I'm not even sure if it's a real city to be quite honest, because it looks kind of horrible, because um, there's absolutely no green space, but all these buildings are all built out of concrete, right? We can build, we can use concrete to do almost everything, um, for those of you that are in, in the seminar, right, remember that I talked about concrete for a couple of minutes. It is a very universal um, material, right? We can do almost anything with it or any shape with it. Now, what is concrete? Well, concrete is usually has usually three components. 
It has the cement, and we'll talk about where cement comes from. It has some kind of sands or pebbles in it. We call that the aggregate. And then it has steel rebar in it. And so the reason why we put steel into concrete is that cement and aggregate that are, are very good to take what we call compression, right? Stuff that, that pushes on it, on it, right? So if I have a big weight that I want to set on something, right? Then concrete uh, cement together with aggregate is great because it really can take on, on that kind of stuff that being pushed together. It is, however, very bad at anything where it's being pulled apart, right? Anytime I have something that pulls me apart, the concrete is going to, the cement and aggregate are just going to fracture basically very, very easily. And now you'll say like, well, if I build a big building, there's not that many places where I pull something to the side of the building or, or upward, right? All the weight kind of goes downward. Um, that's true. But um, we talked about this, did we already? Yeah, I think we talked about this already. No, no, we haven't. So it'll, it'll come up again. But basically, if you think about like a big beam, right? Like the, the floor that you're sitting on right now, if you're not not on the on the ground floor without a basement, right? So any beam, once it starts bending a little bit and every, every beam will bend just a little bit, means that the top of the beam is being pushed together, which is very good because we like being pushed in concrete. But the very bottom part, right, gets pulled apart. So there's always tension at the bottom of any beam. And so that's why we have to have the steel in there to, to take up that tension, right? The steel is very good at at doing tension. It's also good at doing pressure, but it's also much more uh, expensive than, than cement and aggregate, right? And it also rusts, which, which is a big problem, of course. Um, so like the combination of those, however, make, make some very excellent building materials. All right, so let's look at or think about where this stuff comes from. Of course, aggregate, we just kind of dig out of the mountainside somewhere, right? That's or get it out of a, a quarry or something. Um, that's not so bad, but where does the cement come from? Well, one of the major components of cement is limestone, right? So we use basically big quarries to break off uh, limestone right here. There was like, you know, a big, a big set of explosions, and then we dump it into big trucks and haul it out, right? You can kind of see the, the road here at the back, probably even a truck right there somewhere, right? Um, so this is how we get um, limestone. You should if you think about this from an environmental science standpoint, obviously not ideal, right? Uh, just you're disrupting the, the environment. You're, uh, you're using a fair amount of energy to get it out. Um, now, when we have that limestone, we don't just, you know, we don't just use that as concrete. We have, to, uh, we have to kind of do a process to go there, right? So we start out with our limestone that we got from somewhere. We have some clay, or it has pick up somewhere. We take those and we grind them up in a mill then kind of the, the fine powder that we get out of it goes into a silo. Then from there, we pump it together with water and we heat it up so we get kind of a slurry. That slurry then goes into our rotary kiln, which is basically an oven, right? So if you've ever done um, any kind of pottery stuff, right? That's, that's basically the same idea here. Uh, it's just that it continues to turn. And so at very high heat, the, the limestone uh, with clay and water mix uh, goes through uh, a chemical transformation. And basically we get kind of bigger chunks of what is now uh, clinker out of it. Now we take that clinker, we grind it up, mix some gypsum with it and grind it up. And then that's the cement powder that, that we all know, right? So if you go to the hardware store and you buy a bag of cement, that that's that very, very, very fine powder, right? That they mix with water and with sand and do whatever you need with it, right? So that's the process how we get um, how we get cement. Now this is a very energy intensive process, right? So of course we have to get the climb and the limestone from somewhere. We have to run these big powerful mills. We have to heat the water up, and then the most energy intensive part is running this kiln because it runs at very high temperatures. Another downside of creating um, concrete of doing cement is that this chemical transformation that happens that kind of goes from limestone to uh, to cement actually creates CO2, right? So it emits CO2 as it goes along. So it's kind of a little bit of an issue because we don't really know how to produce cement without also creating CO2. And if we're going to use a lot of cement, we're going to use a lot of, produce a lot of CO2. That's potentially a problem, right? And then, of course, we have another uh, mill right here that needs energy. And then we have 
the trucks that drive around everywhere. Right? So you can see all of this contains quite a bit of, uh, of energy, right? So it's not necessarily a sustainable way of doing it. Right? We talked about the idea for just a couple of slides ago that you know part of it was to use um, less non-renewable use resources. Well, there's going to be a lot of energy going in and a lot of that is going to come from from uh, uh, from coal and gas. Now, how does the how does nature do it? Right. So, if we think about in nature, the equivalent to concrete is corals. Right. Corals also take kind of build a similar type of uh, of of uh, of material, but they do it at much better, like you know, much better conditions. Right. So you have you don't have to heat up anything to high temperatures. You're not moving stuff in from all over the place, right? It's it's a very uh, efficient process. And basically, it's the opposite of concrete, right? We said, like, as we're making cement, we're emitting a lot of CO2, whereas to build corals, it takes the carbon out of the ocean water, which means there's more CO2 from the atmosphere that can go into the ocean water, right? So creating more coral actually means that we're, we're using up more, uh, more CO2. So that's, that's actually a good thing. Now, how does nature do it, right? So regardless of where you are in the ocean, there's always gonna be calcium uh, uh, and uh, carbon that is precipitating out, right? That's just a very, very usual thing to do. Just doesn't happen very, very quickly, right? I mean, if you have water sitting around for a long time, you get that kind of white, kind of crusty stuff on your glass, maybe, right? That's basically what that is. Um, now, this happens at, at whatever regular sea temperatures, which is great. Um, but the cool thing that these polyps do that, that are kind of living within the corals is that they kind of change the pH a little bit. And that means that this process happens about 100 times faster than it does in re under regular conditions. Right? So that's why like these corals can actually grow. And as we already said, you know, it's a way of uh, of sequestering atmospheric carbon, right? Because that's now in the coral, and that coral, as you've seen probably, like you know, if you've been scuba diving or or snorkeling or even just walking on the beach, right? That's that material is very hard. That's not just going to let the CO two back out, right? So it's really it's very very well sequestered. Now people have taken this idea and uh, actually. Um, integrated that into a power plant. Um, so basically they take the power plant, they capture the CO2 as it's going out, and then they have this process that they can run through that is similar to what the, uh, what the plants do, and they wind up with something that is more or less cement. Right? You have this kind of white powder here, and you can use that as cement. Now, the problem with that is that it is still very expensive to do right so it's not something that's competitive um but you know if there's if we put a price on on carbon emissions right then that might that the cost of that cement might be going down because you're basically getting a bonus um for taking the carbon out of the atmosphere now why are we so interested in concrete right who cares um how much co2 it does well it's about six percent of the worldwide emissions are are uh, are from cement, right? And that's just the carbon emissions. You can see, like you know, this is a big limestone mine somewhere, right? They can also be be otherwise disruptive. And if we could, you know, cut that six percent in half, right? I mean, that's that's a big change already, right? I mean, three percent of overall carbon emissions would would make a very big difference, right? So this is something that is certainly um, something that we need to think about and, and need to continue to work on because we're not going to stop using cement, right? That's just not, it's not in our, uh, in our near future, for sure. Now, of course, we've been using other natural materials for a very, very long time. Right? We've been using them to do all kinds of stuff from just taking rock and uh, forming it into, into arrowheads um, but then if you want to go a little more complex, right, then we start using uh, hemp maybe for ropes. We have different bones that were kind of maybe tying together with leather to make hooks to go fishing or here some kind of battle axe or something. We can make these fishing traps here out of, out of stuff that we gather out of the uh, environment. And then, of course, we can make, uh, we can create shelter 
um, with using these reeds that are just, just growing in kind of the marshlands. Uh, of course, we can also, I mean, in this case, the person is using a, a wooden boat, but we can also build boats out of, out of these reeds, right? That's one of the first types of boats that people built, right? So for the majority of our history, we've used just materials that are directly from nature, right? We might have um, refined them, right? Like this hook here, for instance, we, we probably, that was not, we don't find a, a bone that looks like that, of course, right? So it got, got cut down and filed around and all that kind of stuff, and then made this connection, all those kind of things are, of course, uh, we did extra, but overall we're getting the materials directly out of nature. And then that changed in the in the 1900s, right? In the 1900s, we started looking at at materials, right? So here is a, a rubber tree, right? So basically here's some natural rubber that we got out of the tree and people had been using that rubber for, for a long time already, but that was just rubber straight off the tree. Um, and then over here, we have a, a high definition uh, image of, uh, of wood, right? And so people started looking at the chemical composition of things like rubber and wood and other natural occurring things and then thought about, well, how can we, how can we create these same types of structures, but maybe with some other properties because we're using some other type of material to do this. And so one of the things we started doing was in the 30s, uh, Hamann Staudinger started creating what we call polymers, right? So polymers, basically what a polymer is, a word out of, made out of two parts, poly and mer. Poly always means many. And in this case, mer is kind of a, a grouping, right? And so a polymer is just a very, very long string of molecules that are stuck together where each section in that long string is, is a replicate of the other, right? So you have the same building blocks all together, right? So you have this building block here. You know, you can think about it going from here to there, for instance, right? And then it repeats again, right? Then we start the blue and then the red is gonna come again. Now, very important in most, or in our artificial polymers that we create, they are usually based on carbon. Right. You can see the big green ones are, are carbon, and those are kind of the backbone that my polymer grows around. And there's, you know, I don't know how many thousand different polymers that we can create, right? So this is nylon, of course, is a very, uh, very uh, famous one. Uh, PVC is another one, right? All those kind of things. And so these are kind of ideas that we got directly from like, understanding how nature creates rubber, which was also, which is a natural polymer. And how can we then, like you know, change it, use different base components to create uh, polymers that are more important for us? Uh, here again is our good friend the gecko, right? So we of course already know that the gecko can walk up and down walls because of these little, little you know fibers, little strings on their on their toes, and it all happens through the van der Waals forces. And so people have gone in and figured out how can we recreate these types of of fibers, right? These little these little strings that are out there. And so they've actually come up with uh, manufacturing processes to do this. Of course, the big problem is that these are, are very small, right? 75 uh, micrometers is, is tiny, right? That's 10 to the minus six meters. That's a thousandth of a, of a millimeter, right? That's definitely not something you can see, right? And so, so it's very difficult to manufacture something like that. And so um, people have found a way to do this um, basically by first creating these nice little straight pillars and then uh, impacting them uh, again and making them kind of bent. And once they're kind of these bent uh, pillars, right, you can see the, the picture down here looks kind of similar like this, right? It's kind of a similar structure. And you can say they're on the same scale, right? So these are the slightly smaller scale, right? That's, that's 10 micrometers here, that's 75, but also that bar is smaller than that one. And this looks to be zoomed in a little bit more, right? So Overall, we can create very similar uh, materials that we can then use. And I already showed you all these examples, right? So we can kind of try to create materials where we then have our little rover here walk up and down a uh, piece of glass, or we can create bandages that are that have the uh, adhesion already built in, right? So that we can just take them and wash them. If the, the adhesive on a, on a bandage is kind of our regular kind of gluey type stuff, then once we wash it, that adhesion is gone, right? So that's all kind of things. 
Um, the other thing that we kind of touched upon when we talked about the idea of recycling, right, is, is of course, if I can build uh, a system where everything is held together by this type of adhesion, then all I have to do is somehow, um, you know, maybe maybe there's a way that I can I can stop that adhesion from happening by putting it under a little bit of current or something, right? So then all of my pieces of this, in this case, the cell phone, um, would just fall apart. Right? You can see this is a, obviously an older phone, it's a flip phone, and actually still has an antenna. Right? We don't we don't do that anymore. Right. So this would be kind of one example um, how we we can we can get stuff from nature. Another thing that we've done quite or are, are is getting much more uh, use is the concept of uh, super hydrophobicity. Right. So hydrophobic, of course, means it's something that does not like water. Right. And one of the ideas is that that if you could build a windshield that is super hydrophobic, right, then no water would ever collect on it. You can always see. And of course, for, for us, we can have windshield wipers and all that kind of stuff. But if you've, uh, well, you're all, all driving and you're all driving through a lot of rain, so you know that, that those windshield wipers aren't always that great, right? If they're a little older and maybe they're a little dirty, like smears everything. So if we look into nature, we can find multiple examples where uh, nature has created surfaces that are just keeping the water right off, right? This is a, a leaf, a lotus leaf, and you can see the water just does not stick to it. It doesn't matter how much water I put on there. If I lift the leaf off, up, the water just rolls right off, right? So like the, afterwards, the leaf is basically dry. And um, that basically works on the concept of what we call the contact angle, right? So how hydrophobic or, or hydrophilic something is depends on kind of how a drop of water reacts with the surface, right? So if if a, a drop of water sits on a hydrophilic surface, right, which means that it likes the surface, then it prefers to be in contact with that surface relative to being in contact with the air, right? So it's going to spread out on that surface. If it's on a hydrophobic surface, then it would prefer to be in contact with the air relative to that surface, so it kind of starts to beat up, right? And we have that. And then if it's super hydrophobic, then it really beats up, right? Then basically I have a little, little bubble of water sitting on top of my surface. And that becomes really interesting. I mean, this, this guy, of course, is, is somewhere out in space, right? You can see how the water bottle, uh, the, the water bubble just sticks together, which is always fun. But if we think about how this happens on plants, then we can, if we zoom in on plants, then we can see the reason why these surfaces are, are super hydrophobic is basically because they have these little structures. They have these little needle-shaped things that are coming out. And so if like these water bubbles, water uh, uh, drops of water are going across it, right, then they can't actually get in contact with the main surface. They're only in contact with those little, with little spikes. And so around that spikes are, of course, air. So most of my water is only being co contacted by air and that's why it stays in that, that little bubble. Um, the other thing that you can see is as these bubbles are, are these, these water drops are going across my surface, they're picking up any dirt that's there. And so that dirt is going to go inside the water and the water is just rolling off. So basically, those plant surfaces are, are super hydrophobic um, to be self-cleaning, right? So every time, anytime water falls on it, it will take all dirt with it. If the water would just be sitting on the plant, then you know the dirt might get into the plant, but then just sits there. And once the water dries, the dirt will be there, so it wouldn't wouldn't change anything. All right. So once we figured out how that works, we could start figuring out how to use that uh, in technology. And one thing that we can use it for is for our kitchen appliances. All right. So um, when I was younger, right, the great new thing were these pans that were non-stick. And they were non-stick because they were uh, made out of material, out of uh, perfluorinated uh, compounds um, that kind of created a non-stick surface. Now that was great because like, you know, food was sticking to your pan and it was all, all fun. Um, but it turns out that those um, compounds weren't very good for you. And that's of course bad if you're using those in the kitchen because you're cooking and you know, you're going to ingest some of them. So obviously that was not a good idea. Um, so now when you buy nonstick surfaces and pans and stuff, oftentimes it's not 
a chemical coating that's on there, but it's a, a, a structure coating. Right? So you have a specific surface structure, and that is what keeps the food from sticking. And it's actually quite interesting, right? So you can use these structures um, to make things that are not stick. And you can see here this, this fabric was, was treated um, with kind of this kind of a type of a, a, um, a non-sticking coating. And you can see how all these drops of water, right? these are not little marbles or something. These are drops of colored water and they all bead up on it, right? So if you had a sofa cushion that, that is like this and you drop your red wine on it, then, or your coffee if you're not wine drinkers, right? Then that would just roll right off your cushion. I don't have to worry about your cushion being, being, uh, being ruined. Of course, you have to hope that then it, uh, whatever's on the floor is also does not uh, not have any problems. Um, but that's that's something that we can do, right? These things are are out there. Um, another cool application is this the sneaker here, right? And so somebody's pouring what looks to be maybe chocolate syrup or something onto their shoe, and you can see it's beating right off, right? So your shoes are going to stay looking brand new for a very long time because the dirt just doesn't stick to it. Right? You could step into the mud and it would still be looking perfectly fine afterwards. The other great thing is the inside coating of food containers, right? Obviously, the most famous one is the ketchup bottle, right? Because ketchup, everybody likes their ketchup, but it is sometimes very difficult to get ketchup out of the bottle, right? It sticks in there, especially in the past. And not only does that cause a mess when you're kind of pounding on the back and so all of a sudden it all comes out. Um, but it also often means that there's a fair amount of ketchup that stays in the bat in the bottle that we just can't get out. And so that's of course in food that's wasted and we don't we don't want to waste food, right? And so people have come up with coatings for the inside of these containers that that basically are non-stick. So ketchup and, and any other kind of uh, kind of semi-fluid uh, like ketchup just flows out of that container. And I can tell you just, over my lifetime, it's really, it's it's amazing. Like when, when I was your guys' age, it was really difficult to get ketchup out of a bottle, right? If you look at older, older movies, that tends to be something that always comes up, right? Nowadays, you know, even if you buy the plastic containers, right, the stuff really just flows out, doesn't stick to the side. So it's a, it's a really, doesn't seem like very important, but just think about all the, all the extra ketchup that we have. All right, another thing that has a fairly large impact on our environment uh, is the, the colors that we use in all of our materials, right? So basically we have two different ways of coloring something. Um, the first one is pigments, right? So we have little little pieces uh, of, uh, of something that's colored and we mix it in with everything else and then that becomes the color, right? So we do that with plastic a lot. There's a lot of pigments in plastic. plastic. Or we have dyes, which basically just are, are a liquid that then turns that material to a different color, right? Jeans are a very, very famous uh, example of that. Now, the problem with most pigments and, and dyes is that they're made out of things that are really bad for the environment, right? So that's oftentimes we, we notice that. Um, so we can look into the environment, like how does how does nature create color, right? We see this, this butterfly here, is, it has very brilliant colors, right? Very, very vibrant. Like you just imagine you have clothes that were that, that blue and shiny or you're phone or your car or something, right? So it's very, very, very intense colors. Um, but it turns out that if you look at this butterfly and you look kind of where, when it's when it's shaded, when the sun is not on it, not on the underside, but if you look at kind of the, the blue colored side, you will notice that if the sun is not on it, then it really isn't blue. It's kind of a brownish black. And so it turns out that this butterfly has these kind of little little uh, almost shells looking on it, right? And if you keep on zooming in on those, um, then you see that it has this kind of weird porous structure. And if you keep on going in, then you see that you have these little almost channels on the surface of these little, little things here. And what happens is that these channels are just wide enough to let a very specific wavelength in. And so of course, what that means is that all the other wavelengths get, get, uh, get reflected back to us. And in this case, only the blue wavelengths are, are taken out, right? So this, this butterfly wing is not colored because it's like, if I look at it, it's blue. It's not because there's a dye in there or a pigment or something. It's just because it's holding back that very specific type of color, right? So it's basically getting its color from its structure 
and not, not from another coloring agent. And it's not just butterflies. We can see that on birds as well. That's a, it's a similar concept if you go close enough into, into the wings. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but when the bird is in the shadow, it's 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 not as brilliant, right? That you don't really see the colors very much, or once it's out there um, in the sunlight, it's much better to see. And people have been starting to use this in in clothing, right? In in fabrics. So if you could create a fabric that has that a certain structure built into it, right? Then it will it will have a very specific color, right? So we don't have to use any dyes. It will be um, be from an environmental standpoint, of course, uh, much better. People have also noticed that we can do some other stuff with that. That is, we can build displays. Right? We're all used to the displays that we have on our our, our, our LCD display, uh, displays on our phones. Um, but of course, a big problem with those displays are if you go out into bright sunlight, they're hard to read. Right, because they don't have enough brilliance to shine back at you. Well, if we could use something like those bird wings or that, that butterfly wings, right? The brighter the light that's shining on it, the more intense the colors are going to be, right? So that's something that I can use easily outside. Of course, if I want to use it when it's dark out, then I'd have to have some kind of light to, to shine on it, right? But most of the times we're out and it's light. So we could use we could use a lot less battery power and, and get you know, get the same result. Right? We use lose uh, we use some less energy and and we don't have to build these very intricate uh, displays. All right, other things that we can we can use this for is in the U.S. It is used uh, to make sure that uh, that dollar bills aren't fake. Right, so there's there's a very specific coloring on them that has the same impact. Right, in, inside of these numbers. So if you only if you have a specific color that has the structure elements in it, um, you actually get the right color. So you can very easily see if something is uh, is fake or, or not. Another thing where people are using it is for uh, makeup, right? So basically, you're creating makeup that is not full of chemicals. Right? Most of the makeup that we have is full of chem chemicals, and so people get get allergies and all that kind of stuff. In this case, you wouldn't have worry about that. And of course. If you get it right and do it like that butterfly, right, then you get also very vibrant colors, which is often what people want in their makeup. Another very cool application to this is uh, coating on bicycle helmets. And so basically the idea is that this obviously looks very nice, but you can, you can get that same color uh, in, in other ways. Um, but the coolest thing is that you can create these little structures and they will basically change um, as uh, as the surface of these helmets change, right? So one big issue that that we have with bicycle helmets is that what happens if you have to use your bicycle helmet and you crash into something, right? Do you buy a new helmet or is the helmet still fine, right? And so if you can create a helmet that changes, like you know, where the, the outside coating, the color coating changes after it's been been impacted, right? Then you can see like, well. This helmet went from green to red, you know, color-wise. So it's time to, to toss it and buy a new one, right? So there's there's all these things that we could that we could do. All right. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to an assignment, and I'll give you the, the groups in a minute. Um, so this is not a written assignment. We're just going to report back at the end of class. And so I want each group to choose a material and then answer these following questions here, right? So I want you to tell me about a very specific use of the material, what are the properties of that material that make it a good choice for whatever use that you chose, uh, what are the potential problems with this material, and then is there a bio-inspired material that could be used instead. Now I'll give you the groups in a second here, and then I'll let you work on this for 20-ish minutes, and then, then we'll kind of report back uh, what we found. Now before I let you before I give you the group numbers, um, I want to just point out that there's another video that I would like you to watch. Um, this is now a video about structures because like you know, we're talking materials today and then next week we're gonna start talking about structures. So this is, this is gonna be a video that helps you to think about these. Now, before I give you the, the, uh, the group numbers, I just realized that I don't have, because this is not an official assignment, 
I don't have this list of questions here. So if you want to maybe quickly do a screenshot or, or, or take a picture or something so that you know what you have to respond to. All right. So I hope everybody had a quick one. Otherwise, come back to it. But these are the groups. Um, I will, as usual, set out breakout rooms. Now we just have to have some more. Eight breakout rooms. You all see what your number is here. So please get into that breakout rooms and then I'll I'll call you back probably 10-ish minutes before the class is over. And I'll I'll jump through the rooms just as usual. Are there any questions about this assignment? Just straight up. Again, this is not there's not an assignment on Blackboard that you have to submit this to. This is just kind of a an in-class activity that, that doesn't go beyond that. All right, then I'll open up the rooms. And I will let you jump into them as as assigned by the slider. 